Hello, I am Kevin Clark. I am here. It is the 28th of May in 2016 and I'm about to commence an interview with Jordan Shalaki. He will talk and then I will ask him some questions from off camera. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jordan Shalaki and I'm here today to talk about how I met David Ferrier and what led up to um, the interview with David Ferrier. Uh, I was in a bad spot um, and needed some money and I contacted David Ferrier over Twitter and he about um, Jane O'Brien media and the tickling and uh, he got a hold of me right away. Um, it started off as a couple questions here and there and then led from him flying from New Zealand into Michigan, Muskegon, Michigan to be exact and can fronting me with twelve hundred dollars is what I, I asked for, for and um, we commenced to having an interview. Um, he did come through with uh, twelve hundred dollars um, and stayed Friday through Sunday um, a complete weekend. Um, we discussed pretty much everything that I personally knew besides some of the things that um, I didn't know and some of the things that he coached me to uh, say. Well, thank you, Jordan. I'm going to start as I just want to ask you some questions to clarify some of what uh, David Ferrier put in the documentary. And I'd like to start with one of the things that is, as you explained it to me earlier, he, te he coached you through what he wanted you to say and how he wanted you to say it. And, and could you explain to us the, the one that foremost comes to mind, the death threats that you were talking about? How did that come about? And, and what did you think it meant? Uh, I think it was a way for him to try to shut down Gene O'Brien Media. Um, he coached me through the whole thing, saying it would be better for publicity um, and better if we had basically said that there were death threats coming in from multiple people, not just including me, um, other people that he had tried to talk to that wouldn't talk to him. Um, and I've never received one death threat. I've never received any threats of any form, but he wanted me to say that I had received death threats and all this stuff was going down and he even wanted me to email him saying that, you know, there was death threats from Jane O'Brien Media um, and the people that were running Jane O'Brien Media when there was, there was no death threats whatsoever. Um, when we cut ties, we cut ties and we went our separate ways. Um, you know, but at the time for the 1200 bucks, I would have let him coach me into saying anything because I needed the money. And at that point, the money was where it was at for me. Um, with my background and having children, that was the most important thing. So I would have said pretty much anything you wanted me to say for the money um, to be able to get by and provide. So in essence, there were no death threats. What that was, in his words, was a publicity angle to use uh, in, 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 the, in, the in the documentary. Okay, now the next question I would like to ask you relates to something similar but not quite exactly the same. In, in the context of what you were saying, the, your contention is that he coached you through every, he, he told you what he wanted you to say and then he told you how he wanted you to say it. Yes. And so he would stop shooting and then coach you again Yes. about um, whatever the circumstances. Let me ask you about David D'Amato. Um, as, as, as I understand it from the conversation we just had, you really had no knowledge of David D'Amato till David Ferrier. No, there was no knowledge of David D'Amato or who even David D'Amato was. The whole time, um, me and multiple other people, it was Jane O'Brien. That's where we got our emails from, that's where the money was sent from was Jane O'Brien. There was no David D'Amato, nothing like that. I didn't have a clue until David Ferrier showed up at my house that David D'Amato or Jane O'Brien was David D'Amato. So basically that whole David D'Amato angle was just a, a, an act from, from David Ferrier to get you to say things yeah. that, that would implicate David D'Amato in whatever it was. 
Uh, another question I would like to ask you is regarding, I, I know I had the conversation with you at the time he was there, and so did you know, Jane O'Brien persona as well, um, where you asked me for $4,000 and you wouldn't talk to them. Yes. Now, could you please explain to us how that happened? Yeah, um, David Ferrier pretty much said, you know, if they don't want this done, then why aren't they giving you more money than what I am? Why don't you write them and ask them for $4,000 to see if, you know, they'll come through with the $4,000. And of course, I was told no. So I went through with the interview and being coached by David Ferrier for the 1200 Now, you, the, again, that's another one of those things where the idea generated from, from David Ferrier. Yes, it, completely. It, it, was, it wasn't you making a play for money, it was him making, making the case to, for you to do that. Yeah, um, basically extort, trying to extort him for money is what he was trying to get me to do and to see if it would actually come through and pull through, which obviously it didn't. Um, you know, obviously it was you on one end and Jane O'Brien, the persona, on the other telling me, no, that's not gonna happen, you know, too bad. Now, um, in, in the context, of, of, again, of, of Mr. D'Amato, it seemed, as when I watched it, it seemed like at one point you were saying, I don't know who I work for, and then all of a sudden you were mad at David. Now, again, this is something where Ferrier coached you to coach, build up the anger and build up the... Yes, I'm very good at acting. He wanted me to build it up and make it to look like it was a blown up scene, and you know I was so, so upset, but in all actuality, I figured it was coming from a, the money was coming from a guy, not a woman in the beginning. So I wasn't surprised. It looked like I was surprised, but in all reality and actuality, I was not surprised at all. Because I, I, doing the tickling, I didn't care where the money come from. So for it to him to be like, oh, it's David D'Amato and me, you know, raising up hands and upset and shaking. No, I was already, I wasn't surprised at all. He cut the scene told me I should act a lot more surprised. So we reshot him saying, did you know it was David D'Amato in me being, acting like, oh, what a big deal, what a big deal, when in all actuality, nobody really gave a shit who David D'Amato was. Well, you know, that was, that was something that was true all the way through. No one really ever cared who they were working for. And many times, they, as, I, as we've mentioned earlier, they thought it was me or someone else. Yeah. Now, I, I want to address something that goes through this documentary all the way through that you could be very helpful with. He, makes, he tries to make the point that people were conned into doing something. Do you, have, do you remember anybody being conned into doing anything? Nobody was ever once coerced, conned, or pushed into doing anything. Everybody was very upfront. When you decided that you wanted to take the contract, you or one other individual would call and explain step by step what was going to happen. Nobody was conned into it. You had the choice whether to sign your contract or to walk out. There was no, if you don't, we're going to do this or this or this. It was cut and dry. If you didn't want to do it, then you didn't have to do it. At times, Jane would tell people, if you don't want to do it, but decide you want to do it, I'll offer you a little bit more money because you don't but it was never pushed on somebody or conned anybody or anybody told they had to do it or else. It was all willingly participants. Specifically, no one, no one showed up and found out it was men tickling men, if that was what we were shooting at the time. That was never, it was, they you knew, knew beforehand. They yeah, you knew beforehand if it was men tickling men or if it was a girl tickling you or two girls tickling you. Everybody knew beforehand what was gonna happen. Before you left your state or your house even to get on that plane, you already knew 110% what was going to happen. And to, to the best of your knowledge, again, everyone was treated well when they got there. Everybody was treated amazing in LA. We, we stayed at the best hotel. We ate the best food. We went to the best clubs. Everybody was treated uh, amazingly. And I think it's fair to say that everyone would come back and do it again. Yeah. There was, there was no hesitation. There was no, oh my God, that was horrible. No, no, I, I have people still getting a hold of me on a daily basis through Facebook, um, Twitter, and everything else asking, how do we get into this? Right. The money's too good, it can't be true, is what you hear, and then when they find out it's true that you can make money, 
everybody wants to do it. Who wouldn't want to get tickled, even, even if you hate being tickled, who doesn't want to be tickled for $1,500, $2,000, for a whole 30 minutes of your time? Now, I, I appreciate all of that because it's important that people understand that what he is projecting is, has very little relationship to what happened. The, the idea that somehow or another people were coerced or that somehow or another people were lied to um, just, just isn't, what it, isn't what we did. No, not at all. His, what he had me do and what he's portraying is way over here and the truth is way up here. He's so far from the truth that, I mean, he, he has no clue what he's talking about. And coercing me, and coercing me to say this when it's not all true. I didn't know he was making a full film, actual documentary. I just thought he was a guy coming from New Zealand to have a chat. Now, also too, you'd mentioned that they were very proud of the fact that, among other things, they'd gotten David D'Amato's, hacked his private documents and stuff like that. Yeah. They were very free with that kind of information. You could tell, in other words, that this was a vendetta against David D'Amato and fuck David D'Amato, pardon the language. Yeah, pretty much it was a screw David D'Amato and yeah, they had to hack it. How are they gonna find out after, how are they gonna find out after as many years as I've been doing it and many years as some of my friends are gonna be doing it, who David D'Amato even was when we didn't have a clue. We tried figuring out who Jane O'Brien was a year or two before this guy even showed up. So he had to hack his, and he was, oh, this is how we found him. We went through his IP and web addresses and found out his dad owned this and this and this. So they were hacking in and doing whatever they could to get information on David D'Amato. Legally or illegally, I don't know, but they got the information somehow. Now, to the, the we under, I, you know, I understand what you're saying and I understand what you mean, but was it apparent to you at the time how malicious he was going to be about what he was doing? No. The take no prisoners, and, and everyone is guilty and every... Now, he did mention to you that everyone at Jane O'Brien is a bunch of criminals that are going to jail. Yeah. That, because that's important that people understand that as well, that that was one of his entrees into, into what he was doing and he was going to take care of that. Now. Personally, in, you know, in, in, in Muskegon, what was he like? He was different. He definitely didn't fit in in my town. He was definitely very, very different. He didn't fit in. Um, and the whole time it was, uh, we're going to get David D'Amato. We're going to get David D'Amato. We're going to, this is what we're going to do. Everybody in Jane O'Brien's criminals are exploiting people. They're, they're doing all this stuff. And I don't see where... Mr. D'Amato or anybody from Jane O'Brien exploited anybody. You knew what you were getting into before you signed your contract. And even if you didn't like what you showed up and were going to do, it didn't mean you had to do it. You got back on a plane, went home without your money, without your contract, and you weren't exploited for anything. It's not like you showed up to LA and you found out, oh, it's dudes tickling dudes, and I already knew this, but I didn't know it to this extreme. It wasn't like you have to do this, you signed a contract, you're gonna do it or we're gonna sue you. It was, all right, this isn't for you. Get back on a plane, go home, thank you for trying. Uh, and you know, that didn't happen very often. I think no. maybe once or twice I, I, I ran into that situation where somebody didn't want to do it, and that was fine. Yeah. You know, because at the beginning of every shoot, if, it's, if, if, there's any, if you're having any problem here, let us know. And we always mix the shoots where there was somebody who'd done it before with someone who hadn't. Yeah. So that they could talk to somebody and find out what it was. And often had them talk ahead of time so they knew what they were getting themselves into. The exploitation issue is one I, I want to just briefly touch again. Because I don't know... I, I mean, I understand the concept of exploitation, but I know that, like I said, most people who did it, 95% at least would come back and do it again in a heartbeat. I would because, go 98% yeah, it Yeah, and so somehow or another, and David keep make, kept making the point that people wouldn't talk to him because for whatever reason, and people wouldn't talk to him because they didn't want their privacy invaded. They did yeah. not want people, they didn't want to be part of whatever it was that he was doing. And he never seemed to grasp that. But so you can say affirmatively to anyone watching who don't know, this wasn't an exploitation of, of innocent people 
being lured into something without their knowledge of what it was. Oh no! Everybody, knew, everybody had complete knowledge of what they were doing. Everybody knew from go, from Jump Street, what they were doing. Nobody was exploited. Nobody, like I said, only a handful of people, two people, have ever did that. That's because everybody is briefed and explained down to the last document what you're going to be doing, how you're going to be doing it, how long it's going to take. When you're, you know, every your itinerary is put right in front of you before you're even signed a contract, so you know they th there was no exploiting anybody. And as you said, you know many people who'd come back in a heartbeat. Yo, oh, yeah, I, I could and yourself I, included. Yeah, I would come back without a problem if the money was there. I'd come back. I mean, where can you make the money that you were making? I mean, for tickling people, I don't care how weird it looks. I've got a family to feed. That money was what made people love it. Now, I, I want to just do a couple of personal things here. Uh, uh, not pers some of them personal to me. Yeah. But the concept, of, obviously, what this was was a flat-on vendetta against Mr. D'Amato, regardless of h however they could do it. Yeah. There was, truth didn't matter, reality didn't matter, it was we're gonna get him and we're gonna get him good. As I said before, fuck David D'Amato. Yeah, that's pretty what, much. That's what this was. Yeah. Now, you met my assistant, um, he's been portrayed as a thug, and a vicious person who came to threaten, to threaten David Ferrier and, and Dylan Reeve. And as with my photographer, who you had was yeah. before your time, these were two sweet and gentle people that have been turned into monsters by this way of turning everybody into a monster because everyone's guilty of the same thing. And the end justifies the means. We're going to say and do whatever we have to do to do it. As you remember, my assistant, was this a vicious person? Your assistant was by far the nicest man I have ever met. He took time out of his day to show me and my friends around LA not one swear word, not one cross word, not anything. He was the most down to earth loving person I had ever met. And he came from a hard background, which even made it better that he was willing to go out of his way to help any of me and my friends who'd never been to LA. We we're getting lost. And he took us in his car, drove us around to any place we wanted to go and was just, well, then, no then, way was then, he a monster. Then, that's the point I'm trying to make. The yeah, point he was I'm never a monster. Is, is turning people that are basically good people I grant anyone who who wants to know that we're doing something that's a little offbeat. That I understand, but it was hardly this n great plot by this. They, he always uses the word "they" are terrible people. Never says who the they are, but then you know you're a bunch of criminals, which causes all kinds of trouble. He had no problem reaching into people's lives as best as he could. And what was really unique about it is everything he accused. Um, Jane O'Brien of, he did in spades. He was much worse with it. He's a hypocrite. You know, the example I gave you earlier was he made a very big point that Jane O'Brien had put up, used people's footage without permission. Then he takes footage of people I shot and uses it without their permission. And, and exploits them far worse than anyone did. For, and, and to follow that example a little bit further, when he came to to Muskegon to offer you the money to talk and then the percentage of the profits that he offered you, which... Yeah, he offered, he, he came with $1,200 and said that if the documentary went big that he'd give me 10% of any profits, gross profits that he made. I've contacted him three or four times and he's not contacted me back, not one time. And the funny thing is, is I've tried contacting him and he sold over 140,000 tickets to these festivals, and I have not seen or heard from them since. Well, uh, the, the details, you know, what what he's gotten in is between him and who he's gotten it in from. We don't, we're not privy to that information. Yeah. Um, I, you know, but what I do know though is that this claiming of coming and exploiting people for money and using them for your own purposes is exactly what he did to you in Muskegon. Yeah, he did. He came into my house and told me. You know, it'll all get better, and it never got better, and then he's making all the money. And, and brought it to, right into your family. Yeah, right, right into, into your home. My, yeah, right in. He, he said it right in front of my parents. He said it right in front of my brothers. Uh, and, I mean, the, he's not going to go against people that are good-hearted people that don't lie and don't have a reason to lie. Well, that, yeah, the... You need, in order to follow his scenario, you needed to lie. Oh, I needed to lie a lot because I needed the money. At that point, I was very, I was in a very low place in my life with three kids, so I had to have the money. And and it, and it hasn't made your life any better, certainly. No, it hasn't made my life better at all. 
Hey, he hasn't he hasn't contacted me back. He's the one making all the money, and I'm still sitting here, broke white kid from Skeegan. Well, no, I, I appreciate all of that. I know how, I know how difficult this is to to admit that you'd made some mistakes and you said some things that weren't true. That's not that's not a position anyone wants to be in. But that's a position of a person who's been exploited for someone else's purposes. Yeah. And and that's that's essentially why we're here today. And essentially why we at least if nothing else go on the record and say, wait a minute, this isn't what happened and this isn't what people were doing. Yeah. Because when we were our purpose in going to New Zealand to meet him was to give him facts about all of the people who. Who were happy with what they were doing and that would gladly do it again and he could we could allow him to talk to them as, as long as we knew that he was going to be fair we went off the record to meet with him and told him we'd be off the record up until the point in time came where we knew he was not going to do a hatchet job and obviously in retrospect that was a very good thing to do because he did a hatchet job yeah you could not trust him he lied at every turn you know how many lies he's told you yeah he's told me numerous numerous lies all the way up until the day that the documentary went big, and then by Jordan, don't call me, don't. No, you know, I, I understand that. And, and as a sidelight, not that this is the largest deal in the world, but as we, we were just discussing, you do have a, mar mar a marijuana medical card in, in Michigan. Yeah. And when he came, he smoked dope with you and partied yeah. and acted like, you know, like, that was, like that was what a news person or, or a a true documentarian was supposed to do. Do you ever remember me smoking dope with you? <laughs> no, never. I don't remember none of you guys. Yeah, no. I remember getting yelled at in LA and the only time that we've ever been yelled at is we were told don't get out, go out and drink and do a bunch of drugs and party. Just Because we're here to work. <laughs> yeah, we're here to work. Right. You know, stay in your hotel room, go to the pool, have a drink at the hotel bar, but we're not here to do drugs and party, we're here to work. Well, I, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I know how difficult it is. I, I certainly understood what I saw when I saw it and what it was. You, it was scripted. You could see it. You could see what he was doing. And I know that there's nothing that you can feel good about that part of it for, but no. you should be very proud of yourself for coming and at least telling us the truth here now. And I appreciate it very much. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.